Ready for some humor? Ready to laugh? Okay. It's my attempt. <laughs> we'll see, see how this lands. <clears throat> Circuit riding preacher trained his horse to go when he said, Praise the Lord! And to stop when he said, Amen. Preacher, man of the horse, said, Praise the Lord! And went for a ride in the nearby mountains. When he wanted to stop for lunch in the mountains near a stream, he said, Amen. He took off again by saying, Praise the Lord. The horse started heading toward the edge of the cliff on a narrow mountain trail. The preacher got excited, said, Whoa, whoa, and then remembered, Amen. The horse stopped just short of the edge. The preacher, so relieved, and he looked up to heaven and said, Praise the Lord. <laughs> yes, that's the end. That's what happened. Who knows? It's a lesson in training your horse when you're a circuit preacher riding on a horse, riding off in the woods. The bigger theme, two masters. Um, I'll get to that, some of that, but first... I like to introduce a little bit of Richard Rohr. For those who have never read Richard Rohr, because he has some great things to say, he pulls together a lot of pieces of theology which are also fantastic. And this is from September 15th, where he said, he has a couple quotes, one from Jesus here from the Gospel of Matthew. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And from St. Francis, before you speak of peace, you must first have it in your heart. And then Richard Rohr continues. Much of Christianity seems to have forgotten Jesus' teachings on nonviolence. We've relegated visions of peaceful kingdom, of a peaceful kingdom, to a far and distant heaven. Hardly believing Jesus could have meant that we should turn the cheek here and now. It took Mohandas Gandhi, a Hindu, to help us apply Jesus' peacemaking in very pract practical ways. As Gandhi said, it is a first-class human tragedy that peoples of the earth who claim to believe the message of Jesus, who, they, de who they, they describe as the Prince of Peace, show little of that belief in actual practice. It took Martin Luther King Jr., drawing from Gandhi's work, to, br to bring nonviolence to the forefront of the American consciousness in the 1960s. Nonviolence training has understandably emphasized largely external methods or ways of acting and resisting. These are important and necessary, but we must go even deeper. Unless those methods finally reflect inner attitudes, they will not make a lasting difference. We all have to admit that our secret thoughts they're often cruel, attacking, judgmental, and harsh. The ego seems to find its energy precisely by having something to oppose, fix, or change. When the mind can judge something to be inferior, we feel superior. We must recognize our constant tendency toward negating reality, resisting it, opposing it, and attacking it in our minds. This is the universal addiction. Authentic spirituality is always first about you, about allowing your own heart and mind to be changed. It's about getting your own who right. Who is it that is doing the perceiving? Is it your illusory, separate, false self? Or is it your true self? who you are in God. Thomas Keating wrote, We're all like localized vibrations of the infinite goodness of God's presence. So love is our very nature. Love is our first, middle, and last name. Love is all. Not sentimentality, but love that is self-forgetful and free of self-interest. 
This is also marvelously exemplified, exemplified in Gandhi's life and work. He never tried to win anything. He just tried to show love. And that's what ahimsa really means. It's not just a negative. Nonviolence doesn't capture its meaning. It means to show love tirelessly, no matter what happens. That's the meaning of turning the other cheek. Once in a while, you have to defend somebody. But it means you're always willing to suffer first for the cause, that is to say, for communion with your enemies. If you overcome your enemies, you failed. If you make your enemies your partners, God has succeeded. So that's a bit of a challenging piece for everyone, just to recognize what is our true self, our true nature, separating out that which is false from what is eternal and true. And ultimately, it's a simple question, what is the nature of God? And if we're okay with God as a primary nature being love, then that at least gives us some guidance around how that can be a guiding force in our day-to-day moment-to-moment reality. I think one thing that's simple is recognizing when we're out of alignment with that, pausing, taking a deep breath, trying to settle, figure out what might be going on, and get back. Find our spiritual center once again. Today's scripture from Jesus about money is admittedly a challenge. Especially how uh, trying to use of make Uh, make use of other people's wealth. A few things about the story and where we can locate this particular person within the story. We only know a couple things about him. We know that there is a rich man and an unjust manager where charges have been brought against this man. We don't know all the details. We can assume that he's been going on like this for some time as the manager is only now considering what he will do. Before this moment, he hasn't been challenged. Manager realizes there's also a social aspect to what is taking place in this. And that's what really gets him motivated, to do something different than what he's always been doing, which so far we know has just been simply unjust, not right. He says, I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. All right. Knowing that those are his two options should he continue on his way, he decides he's going to act shrewdly. Going out, he's making deals with those who owe the master. In this fashion, he's acting a little bit like a debt collector and coming back to his master even though it's not the full amount. He also wins friends. He cuts them deals, restores relations. The manager, the business and what is owed to the master. To quote Jesus, then he asked another, how much do you owe? A hundred containers of wheat, he said to him, take your bill, make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of the light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. That's a little bit of a mind-bending thing and phrase from Jesus. Where is this all going? What does this all mean? And what does that all mean about unjust wealth? I think this is where... You have to pivot a little bit from where Jesus is speaking about this particular person to the eternal. It's a spiritual shift. And from the perspective of the eternal and where we're going, it makes a whole lot more sense. It makes us hopefully question those things and decisions in our life that are purely for the acquisition and our, where our ruling love is. Where is our heart centered around this? On its own, wealth is wealth. We have that quote from Swedenborg about its use. But on its own, if it's only about money and what material gain it can be, and there is no God in the picture, that is trying to serve two masters. So if we shift to the eternal, 
further down, and it's not what was read today, but this continues in a parable that Jesus says. There is a rich man dressed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in cool water and place it on my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. It's a stark warning and contrast for how we are acting in this world and how it translates to the next. And I think uh, one thing that's very encouraging, inspiring, Warren Buffett, Bill and Melinda Gates have both signed legal documents. They are giving away the majority of their wealth before they die. They understand they're not taking this with, with them. They also understand they can do an enormous amount of good, charitable, useful work while they're still here. They're both brilliant minds, and they have decided at some point in their lives, enough is enough about how much money is enough. They've also decided they're in positions of power to do some real good work in the world. They've essentially decided to not serve the master of money. I'll share just briefly my own moment, my own journey, where these words were different than just something I read on a page. They became living in my life. And I'd been working in the banking industry. I was working at KPMG, a big four accounting firm, which you know, they handle basically all the auditing of corporate America. And uh, boy, I, I lasted about six months in that job when I felt like this line from scripture, it took hold of me. And it was more than that. It was like, wow, this is not just some words said back then. This is live. This is real. I have no time to dedicate to what I've studied, which is about God. I can't serve two masters. I walked out. And the same thing that happened a few hours after that was doors opened up. The chaplaincy position opened. I was able to step right through on that same day. Someone had just dropped out that day. I didn't know. God knew. Those moments in our lives when we listen for the whispering of the Holy Spirit in our lives, take notice. They're going to happen again and again until hopefully something shifts. Something opens in our hearts and minds to allow something different than what the world gives. And I'll conclude with a story. It's been told in various forms, and this is the Cherokee version of it. One evening, an elderly Cherokee brave told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside us all. One is evil. It is anger, envy, jealousy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The other is good. It is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, 
generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The grandson thought about this for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf wins? To which the old Cherokee simply replies, the one that you feed. That story translates very well with the two masters. May the Lord so help us all to discern for each of us in our own lives. Amen.